Lou, good to have you tonight. Make yourself at home. We're, we're just country folk. And uh, we're live now. Okay, we welcome those who may be watching by way of the stream. We have been, it's been busy. And we are now back in the Family Life Center and around us. Hearts with Hands has cases of relief that has been packed up, and this is going to Florida. And uh, so we're going to be praying for the people in Florida who have been, been victimized by the storm, and especially the families of, that are bereaved because of the assaults of the storm. And uh, bodies, many have not been found. They're looking. We hope that they're with a family member somewhere and hadn't told anybody yet. And then I learned we had a police officer killed in Fair Bluff. Was that yesterday? Uh, I had been on the news. In Fair Bluff, no, right, right across the border, right there at O'Ree County. Was shot yesterday. I'm assuming he died. I had heard. And then one of the officers in Florence that was critical died. Uh, she's the one we prayed for. Mary Daniels attends a, a Bible study, the uh, Fellowship Bible Study uh, in Florence, and this officer would take her time and serve as security uh, for the Bible study and to, to be at the Bible study. And Mary told me she's just a radiant Christian and has small children, and we're going to be praying for, for her family. And there are two others still critical. So... The Caraway, the police officer, uh, he, he died on the scene, and now the second person. And we just need to pray for God to bless them. Uh, Jubilee is, is here with two weeks tomorrow. And so please pray for Jubilee. And just a word about it if you're new. Jubilee is different. Not by design. Not my design. But I had an old pastor, Randy Hardiman. He and I don't know if you would even know the name Mays Jackson. Who who would know the name Mays Jackson? I'll date you if you know Mays Jackson. He was on radio for years, and uh, he and Randy Hardiman started the Glen Haven Jubilee. Oh my, how many years ago? And uh, Brother Randy uh, retired, and then Glen Haven relocated. And when they did, they didn't continue the Jubilee. But Randy Hardiman taught me everything I know about Jubilee. And uh, it, it's a bit surprising how some of this impacts people. But the thing Randy told me, he said, now, Brother Freddie, he's a little short guy. Looks like Colonel Sanders almost, except a little stouter, not the goatee. And, uh, but just as sweet as he could be. And he said, now, Brother Freddie, you want to do Jubilee? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, you want God to bless it? I said, yes, I do. He said, do you want? people to get a real benefit? I said, obviously. Yes, I do. He said, well, number one, the thing that keeps Baptist churches from having jubilees is money. He said, Baptists love their money maybe more than they love God. And so you think about it. And you go to do an event like we're doing, this will be our 30th now, 30 years this year, God's blessed us. He said, now, don't let anybody budget Jubilee. He said, you, you don't have the money in the bank and say before the people, we by faith are trusting God to meet the needs of Jubilee. And you can write the check. He said, people see through that at 100 yards. He said, don't put a dime in the bank. In the bank. Trust God to do it during Jubilee. And when people see what God's doing, they'll say, hey, God's in this Jubilee. And that's how we get the, the confirmation from God to go to the next one. Because we don't put money in the bank for it. But some of the weekends we've had through the fall, it'd be tough to, to, to even bankroll that. But he said, trust God and he'll bless you. And so the highlight really has become that Jubilee offering. Now, a lot of Baptists will run from it. In fact, I had a person, oh, 25 five years ago, probably, we've been doing it a few years, a uh, young couple, a lady came to me, and, and she'd gone to Bible college, and uh, she said, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. I said, what's that? She said, do you know when you're going to take the offering? And I'm thinking, well, she wants to know when so she can give, and she says, no, I'm going to invite some friends 
but I don't want to invite them whenever you're going to take the offering. Hmm, I didn't quite understand that. I said, so I had her tell me again. And she said, I'm afraid they may be offended. Hmm. Now, whenever we get offended when we witness something God's doing, now in 30 years, in 30 years, so we tell folks this, people who give, and then maybe the wife didn't okay it, or something happened, we give it back to them. See, the gift isn't to us, it's to God. And so this year, I believe we're going to have a great jubilee. I'm looking forward to, to all that God's put on the table for us. And please, on Friday at noon, here we're going to have uh, Kufi, Brother Victor Stursky. Some of you have not met him. He's a, the East Coast Director for Christians United for Israel. It's a pastor's luncheon, but we're going to open it. To, uh, to the public and our folks who want to come. We just need to know who's coming because he's requested chicken bog and uh, Mac Hudson, I've already lined up to, to cook us some. So that, that should be beneficial. And then on, on Friday night, we're going to have a night to honor Israel. And I'm unapologetic. My land is right here. I can tell often where people stand on Israel in, in Walmart. I mean, I've, I've seen, seen some people will take out a dagger almost when they see Christians in the Israel. And once that man said, how can, you, how can you support Israel? I said, what do you mean, how can I support Israel? Oh, you do? I bet you do, Charles. But anyway, I said, well, it's, they're God's chosen, and God told me if I did, he'd bless us. And, and so I need to bless them. And I said, you ought to try it. And they don't, they don't know how to handle that. But anyway. It's good to have you tonight. Welcome to the study. We are going to look at some uh, a video uh, to introduce where we're going to go, and I, it, we're we're close to next week. Uh, a plan to meet, and then the Friday, the Tuesday before Jubilee, we uh, we'll know next week if we can make that work. We got we've got a lot to get done. And I thought I had had that on Tuesday. You know, we probably will. You, this, you, you brought up a good point because this is midterm before we've had them in the back. So that would we'd have to almost go back to the uh, and and then Tuesday before Jubilee we have we have prayer for Jubilee, and uh, so any, that's open to anybody to come and participate and. Uh, I have got to, this thing is supposed to take me to where I have been, and I have sit here talking and didn't get it there, so let me look in my history for it. Here we go, here we go. You see that? Is that on the screen? All right, Divine Counsel. We're going to look at this for a little bit. This is an hour and a half video, and let me back this up to the beginning, and uh, let me introduce it, so let me stop it. Now... We have been studying, and the books we use, uh, the uh, supernatural and the unseen realm, and then this book, and I really don't know if we got any, any of that material here. We got it boxed up somewhere. Do we know where these are? Uh, the box from last week with the angels book in it, we had a couple of those, didn't we, in the supernatural? Oh, they wouldn't be in her office. No, they'd be somewhere else. I, I don't know, but I don't think they'd be in her office unless somebody, because it's locked when I leave. And, well, this, this is a primary book. Lay, lay level is good stuff. This one is a study guide. You can do this in your Bible and, and know a lot. So you can, you can get this if you, if you want to get into more in-depth, but this will give you a feel for all of it. And uh, also the, well, this one, this is, this is the big gun. I say big gun, it's, it's heavy duty. It is a collegiate, not collegiate, seminary level, uh, even graduate level study. 
And it's not that that's that complicated, it's just that it's that thorough. Yes, sir. Oh, really? That's why we couldn't find it. Now we know where they are, Kent. Back side of the piano. Don't worry about it now. We, 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 we'll make sure we got those. And then during Jubilee, I, I want, we need a book table. For, we got a whole truckload of ABI stuff. Much of what we got, if you went to life away, you couldn't find it. And, 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 uh, but it's, it's good material. We're going to put a table up during Jubilee. And uh, so I'm going to need some help with, with folks who won't mind helping uh, man that table for us. But let's go, let's go back here. You're going to hear some things tonight that, that is not new, but different. You ever met somebody, and uh, I'll give you an example. Those young fellow here in our community. I knew him as Jack Bullock. He was a painter. Some of you might have known Jack. Uh, that's not his name. His name's David. But he was called Jack. Everybody knew my Jack. If you went, if you went probably on his road and said, you know, I need David Bullock's house, they'd say, who? Nobody knew about David Bullock. They knew about Jack Bullock. Uh, we, we, we've, got, we've got folks in the church, and maybe you're known by nickname. Now, here, here's what was confusing for me. This was my problem when we look at this study. I knew the powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, these things. I knew that they were not flesh and blood because Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10, tells me that. I knew that. But I never connected any practical application. Everything was like, well, let's say, do you, do you know what the word temptation is? Have you ever experienced temptation? You know, unless it's a big banana split, you can't hardly touch temptation. But it gets in your mind, and you get to wanting it. And so that was kind of my idea of what it meant to wrestle with these powers. But these powers and principalities don't fit that kind of definition. It's more, you see, that banana split... I can take it or leave it. That's my choice. But let's use a parallel. Now, I make no apology that when it comes to snakes, I have no affection. I have no curiosity. I've got one motive that goes through my mind when I see one. It's called run. I don't touch them. I don't want them touching me. But the fact that I feel that way, does that mean if I step on one, he won't bite me? When, when we get too close to the enemy, he can strike. If we don't recognize the enemy, that's like going in your backyard blindfolded. You don't know where you're walking. You don't know what you're walking with. And then years ago, I heard an old preacher who preached the sermon entitled Sleeping with the Snakes. And, and, and really, when it comes to sin in the last few decades, if we had any fear of sin, there are certain sins that we have built an immunity to. I mean, their words don't have the same meaning. Did you know last year almost 50,000 people died of heroin or an opiate high in this country? Nearly 50,000. That's, that's about the number of men we lost in Vietnam. When, when, when you stop adding up, shouldn't we have a fear? I mean, cold sweats break out. If you put me in a room with one rat snake, <laughs> even when you had to be a big one, I'm, either I'm getting out of there, or he's gone. One, one of us got to go. We're not roof both of us. But we're living in a day where we become so acclimated to things that we've lost 
any fear. And, and that's sad and tragic. Now here's, he, he, here's what really disturbs me. It's in the church. And we're going to look at this tonight. I have not, noted uh, over the years some of the, some of the Hollywood crowd, some of the rock music crowd, some of the athletes whose lifestyle is a mockery of everything that's in this book. Boastfully. Boastfully. Some of the athletes boasted of how many women they'd slept with. And all these other things. Glamorizing the whole, the whole of fornication. I mean, just glamorizing it. And you're thinking, what kind of influence is that on our youth? Who, who idolize these athletes. And then at the end of the day, when they win a championship, they say, I want to thank God. Now, how does that fit anything when the lifestyle is a, is a blasphemy against God? So I drew a conclusion a long time ago. They don't serve the same God I do. But they address him as God. There is two, three, four, five. We're learning that. Elohim was a word I learned in Bible college seminary that is a name for God. And we have taken in our English concept some, some of the really heart-stirring praise songs. Give glory to Elohim. And so I kind of had that word reserved. But Elohim in the Hebrew is the same word we would have for a little God. It's Elohim. But there's only one Lord, Lord God Almighty. There's only one who is the highest. And that's the Lord God, capital G, Elohim. Then you got those hundred. Now, when we first began to unwrap this a little over two years ago, some people couldn't handle it. And, and there were even some who came. One guy came by the church, a lady did, and asked Karen and said she heard I'd quit teaching the Bible. Or believe in the Bible. Because people are hearing things in a different way. Same word. It's just like Jack Bullock. Is David. A little G God was created by the Lord God Almighty. The creator of the universe. We have, we have to have enough range in our understanding to see that and understand how it fits. Now, this divine counsel we were introduced to in Psalms 82. Now, we're going to go to the source tonight. We're, this is a lecture by Michael Heiser, Ph.D., and it's a course he teaches, the Divine Council 101. Now, we're not going to do all of it, but I want you to hear a little bit of it, and one or two things will happen. Well, once he begins teaching, all of us may want to run out and enroll in some class uh, because you're going to hear a lot of, uh, if you go to the end of it during the Q&A, you hear a lot of just theology talk. Now, theology will do one of two things. If you stay awake through it, if you can just stay awake and follow it, you could get a blessing in the day. That's not why I'm showing you this. I'm showing you this so you might have an understanding from the author of the book, these books I've shown you, he wrote every one of those. And his newest book on angels is just great. Now, let's, let's, let's listen in. We're going to go to class, go to school. a short video introducing the concept of the Divine Council. And it's on YouTube, by the way. In video, we'll get into this a little bit more with the Divine Council of the World of you, which folks is a lot of here on the third too. You're going to have to be familiar with the Divine Council and again, the worldview of biblical theology associated with it. Uh, because again, I'm not going to be stopping to explain everything, uh, explain this concept and what stems from it in uh, my weekly sessions on Naked Bible Podcast. So it's going to really help if you have this in your head and understand it, at least again to the brief extent that I presented it here, because I was built on it. Uh, in those other weekly installments. So let's just jump in here briefly. 
We're going to start in Psalm 82. This is sort of the go-to passage for the Roman Council. And you can look in your Bible if you go to Psalm 82 or in the ESV. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now notice that God is in blue. I clicked on it in my software. That's why the column here is blue. Underneath the word translated in English, God, is the Hebrew word Elohim. <clears throat> Nothing unusual here. Elohim is a very common term for God. If we go to the second half of the verse, and this is the gods of old judgment, we click on that and look and see what is in our Hebrew Bible. That is also the word Elohim. So two times you have the word Elohim in the same verse. The first occurrence has to be singular in the translation because this verbal, it's a participle, that taken his place or taken his stand, it's singular, and so that requires the subject that goes with it to be translated singular. So God. But here, gods, that comes after the prepositional phrase in the midst of. You can't be in the midst of one. It requires a plural. Plus, if we look down at verse 6, where God, this is the same psalm, Psalm 82, verse 6 now, God is addressing the members of his divine council, the members of the heavenly host, and he says, I said, you are gods, like there, and then Elohim, sons, sons is obviously plural, right here, sons of the most high, all of you. Again, it has to be plural. The second occurrence must be plural. There is nothing else that can be. And they're also not people. He says, nevertheless, like men, you shall die. And this is the normative thing that you would say to an Elohim. If we look here in Psalm 89, we see again that, again, the Elohim members of God's council, back here, called the sons of God, the sons of the Most High. The Elohim members of God's council are not people. They are not human beings. But incredibly, that's what you're going to hear and see uh, you know, churches, study Bibles, commentaries, whatnot, especially if they're evangelical. They want to avoid the text at this point. This is why I like to take people to Psalm 89. Now, if you want a real detailed, lengthy refutation of what I'll call the human view of Psalm 82, the cheating view, you can go to my website, drmsh.com, and click on the part in the uh, Scrolling window there for the Divine Council. You can go to www.thedivinecouncil.com and get lots of articles there that take you into all the more details about why that view is incoherent. But I just like to take people to Psalm 89 because if you read it, we have here the Assembly of the Holy Ones. You know what that is. It's the Divine Council again. And guess what? It's in the skies. It's not on earth where people are, it's in the skies. And the psalmist says, who among the heavenly beings? He says, like God, heavenly beings, but hey, hey. Again, the divine counsel is in the spiritual realm. It is not in the earthly realm. It's in the heavens, quote, unquote. Again, that, that line is what the Bible uses for the spiritual place, the spiritual world. And this is not a council of people running the affairs of the world from the spiritual world. It makes no sense at all and has absolutely no biblical support. But if you look at Psalm 82 and Psalm 89, you might start to think, well, that just sounds like a pantheon, or polytheism, or something like that. Well, that's why I've devoted so much time to Psalm 82, to explain what's going on here. So this slide just takes you through different occurrences. We'll get to what's going on in Psalm 82 in a moment. Here you have again some of the same terminology, the Bnei Elohim, Bnei Elohim, Sons of God. You can click out to these passages. We'll just go to Psalm 29, verse 1. Ascribe the Lord of heavenly beings. You click on that, you get Bnei Elohim again. Ascribe the Lord of glory and strength. And the psalmist is demanding that the other inferior divine beings that are around, he knows are real, that they worship the Lord, the unique Yahweh, the one who is superior and incomparable. And these beings are real. We're not talking about cartoon characters. Oh, worship the Lord, Batman, Superman, Donald Duck. And if you try to, to substitute what the text actually says of the spiritual beings in counsel, in an assembly of hope with God, taking orders from them, if you try to deny their existence and then just say, well, they're 
you know, their idols or something. Well, guess what, folks? There's, there's no group of idols in the skies, in the spiritual realm, taking orders from God. Other passages that have God creating members of the heavenly gods, the other gods. God is not an idol maker. They're not people, they're not idols, they're spiritual beings, they're also not cartoons. They're real. Other passages have God among or above the elephant or the alien. Again, if these are just cartoon characters, it's not any item of praise to say God is greater than Mickey Mouse or Santa Claus. Okay? It just strips, it guts praise passages, like in these songs here, that glorify God and all these other beings. If those beings don't really exist, it turns them into nothingness and an absurdity. Let me click out here to Deuteronomy 32, 17. I think this will help make the point as well. And this is the Net Bible. We read, they sacrificed, they as the Israelites here in the context, this is a chapter 932 of one of Moses' sermons to the Israelites about their history. They sacrificed to demons, not God. To gods, they had not known. To gods, they recently come along. The first two of these, we have here, we have Shadim, demons. Again, these are regarded as real spiritual entities. Paul. In 1 Corinthians 10, quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17. When he talks about demons, he believes they're real. And if you're not going to believe they're real, then you have to deny what Paul says. Paul was wrong. Well, he wasn't wrong. If they sacrifice demons, not God, Allah. It should not be translated plural. Like they sacrifice to demons who are not gods. You know how many translations cheat like this? Let's just go up to... Let's go to the ESV. The ESV has a poor translation here. They sacrifice to, to demons that were no gods. If I click on this, we have Eloah, which is a singular noun. It is always singular. This is a cheating translation. And to get away from what the, the Hebrew text obviously says. So if we go back to the Net Bible, the Net Bible does a great job with this. They sacrifice to demons, not God. There's a singular. So it should be. It's a singular noun. Eloah, it is always singular. Every word occurs in the Hebrew Bible, including here. So they sacrifice demons, not God. To God, this is also the word Elohim, they have not known. So it's very clear. You have these demonic entities. Again, this Shadim is actually a term for like a guardian spirit. We'll talk in our next video about why that word choice occurs here. But they're real spiritual entities that are hostile to God. And Paul referred to those principalities and powers. If you don't believe they're real, well, then you might as well just chuck the New Testament, or at least other place that talks about the spiritual world. Okay? We're not going to cheat like that here. What about the incomparability of Yahweh, the God of Israel? Look at all these statements, Mike. There's none besides me. There's none like me. Well, guess what? They're all true. The phrases are not denials of the existence of other Elohim. They are statements of the incomparability of Yahweh. Yahweh is different in some way, actually several ways. He is species unique among the Elohim. There are none like him. He is alone in what he is. But how do we know that? Well, there are passages that talk about incomparability. The denial statements, in fact, occur in the same chapters as books that refer to other Elohim. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 32. We don't need to look at Deuteronomy 32. So we just look at verse 17. that has the God as real spiritual entities. Well, those same passages have God saying things like, there's none beside me. It can mean that the other ones don't exist. I actually like these two references, Isaiah and Zephaniah, because the same denial phrases, there's none beside me and all that, are used elsewhere, namely these two passages, where denial of existence just is not possible. Let's click out. We'll see what I mean. Here we have, can go up here, the context here, we have the Chaldeans. We're talking about Babylon. Okay? Babylon is being addressed, and you come down here to verse 8, and Isaiah says, this is the way Babylon talks about herself. Who say in your heart, I am, there's no one besides me. Well, it can't mean that there are no other cities on the planet, can it? It must mean 
that Babylon is saying, I'm incomparable. And the, the, the point of phrasing is not the denial of the existence of what you're comparing yourself to. It's the fact that you think you're incomparable. Same thing with Zephaniah, except here it refers to Nineveh. And denial of, of existence just isn't possible in these passages. So how do we understand all this? What about monotheism? Well, what we really have here is a cultural context problem, not a theological problem. What I mean by that is monotheism as a term was actually coined in the 17th century AD. It's a modern term. It really doesn't adequately describe what an Israel, an Orthodox worshiper of Yahweh, God, is to believe. They couldn't deny the existence of other Elohim because they're right there in their own Bible. But at the same time, Yahweh was unique. There was none like him. So, so how do we do that? How did an Israelite who believed that Yahweh was unique, there is none like him? How do you articulate the relationship of Yahweh to the other Elohim? The answer and to this is, is derivable from the text. I want to illustrate something to you first. I'll ask the question, who gets called Elohim in the Bible? Well, here's a list. God of Israel, of course, Psalm 82, and lots of other places. The gods of the divine council, we just saw that in Psalm 82. Gods of the nations, like Ashtoreth, Timosh, and Milcom, uh, they all get called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. Demons, we saw that. The disembodied human dead, we haven't looked at that one. That's 1 Samuel 28, when Saul consults the meeting of Endor, and she is able to uh, contact. Uh, Samuel, and Samuel comes up from the ground, and the medium says, when, when she sees Samuel, she says, I see Elohim coming up out of the ground, and it's all, so what does he look like? And she describes him, and he's like, yep, that's, that's Samuel. And Saul was correct. It was Samuel. How do we know? Because Samuel speaks the word of the Lord to him. After he comes up, he's a little grumpy. Why have you disturbed me? He, he reiterates what he had told Saul before in private conversation about God's judgment, and it comes to pass. And we know this is Samuel. Samuel, the disembodied Samuel, the dead Samuel, the Samuel in the, on the other side, the after, is referred to as Elohim. You also get angels, or I would say one particular angel is called Elohim in Genesis 35. I want to say the verse form is plural there. It mentions God. And if you go back to the context, Genesis 32 and look at Genesis 48, you know, I think that the, the best reason for the plural in Genesis 35 7 is these events reference two beings who are both Yahweh, the angel and the invisible Yahweh himself. But anyway, here's the point a person who knew their Bible, who was reading it in Hebrew, would know that Elohim is his point, is not just used of one. Being. Elohim gets used of a variety of beings. Therefore, Elohim is not a word that is attached to a specific set of unique attributes. It can't be, because the, the disembodied dead are not on the same attribute par level with the God of Israel. No one is. No thing is. And yet the biblical writers used the term of a range of beings. They didn't think of the term Elohim the way we think of the term G-O-D. See, when we see that, we immediately mentally assign a specific set of attributes to that, that word and then think, well, there can only be one of those. That is not the way the biblical writer thought about the term. The biblical writer heard Elohim and they didn't think of attributes. They couldn't. Because not all these beings share the same attributes. So what did they think of? This is what they thought of. Elohim is a term you would use of a being to describe where that being properly belongs. It is a term of residence. It is a realm-related term. So in the spiritual world, there are many Elohim. There's God, Yahweh, the Godhead, 
their demons, their disembodied dead, their angels, their gods, their counselor. All spiritual beings occupy the same realm, what we call the spiritual world. If you get labeled as Elohim, it just says, that's where you belong. That's your proper domain. Now, in that domain, Yahweh is unique. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. He is a comfort. This is what Elohim means to the biblical writer, in biblical theology. And you're going to have to get used to my stance on things like this. I don't care what tradition says. I don't care what theology books say. I don't care what creeds say. I'm not anti any of those things. But none of them trump the text. The text is why we're here. The text is what's inspired. The text is what we look at. The text should be where we get our theology and nothing else. Now, let's talk a little bit about divine counsel, hierarchy. We've got here, I use a pyramid shape, a nice triangle shape. We've got Yahweh at the top. Again, the members of the Godhead. Uh, in this video, I'm not going to get into the Old Testament, uh, how the Old Testament displays or gives glimpses of the Godhead. Again, you can even blog from that kind of thing. We'll hit it in other ways, too. Sons of God is actually sort of a rank term. Okay, within the spiritual world, there is rank. All Elohim are over here. But there's Yahweh at the top, and then there's the sons of God, Malachim, what we think of as angels. This is actually a lower duty, a lower role. So they're all Elohim. But in terms of what they do and what they're responsible for, what, they're, what their spirit of authority are for, what their jobs are, Malachim and angel is basically just a job description. They're entire when it comes to what they do. So the divine council is where the cosmos is directed. It's where God issues decrees and gets things done, gets, gets things accomplished. The council is really, again, you know, made of all divine beings, but in biblical theology, all the way back to Eden, all the way to Revelation, the divine council will also, it was, it was originally intended to include believers. Okay? Again, in my book, The Unseen Realm, I, I did a lot of space, a lot of pages to explain this. That originally, where God lived, Eden, is where God worked in the home office, Eden. And that's where humans were. The idea originally was God to dwell among his created beings, both on, you know, on earth and on the earth, humans, and his counsel with him. This is why we have plurals in Genesis 1.26. Let us create human kind in our age. God is speaking to his counsel, to his heavenly hands. Yeah, I want to create beings who are like me. You're already like me. Uh, in some way, you know, share attributes and you know, that sort of thing. Because God shares attributes with us humans, too. You know, we, we, this is just standard theology, Christian theology. There are communicable attributes. And some attributes we don't have, but uh, you know, most of them we, we have in a, in a small way. Well, God wants his divine family and his human family to be together to live together, and to run his creation together. Okay, to help him run the cosmos. This, this was the original intent. And of course, we know about the fall and how it was ruined. The rest of the story of the Bible is how to restore Eden. It's so why the book of Revelation ends with Eden again. And all these descriptions in the New Testament about believers, you know, to, to the, 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 as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the sons of God. The language is not accidental. Being a child of God is to be a member of God's family, which by definition means being a member of God's business, okay? What God is doing. So the council will ultimately include glorified, divinized, or angelified, these are terms that you the academic literature, uh, believers. And everybody's going to have their duty. You know, there's this whole notion about when the heavens are going to be a place where we sit around in clouds and play harps, it's just nonsense. It's not biblical at all. What we'll be doing is helping God run the new Eden, which is the entire earth, and enjoy it. As originally planned. We'll have lots to do, lots to see, lots to experience. Yeah. Where we get our notions is just somehow, I think, just, just silly. You know, some of the things that we think about. We're not rooted in the text. 
Now, there are some council members who were done. We learned that from Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, of course, Genesis 3. We have a divine being there who's in rebellion to try to get rid of humanity by having humanity sin. And we know all this. This is why we get uh, Shejim, really. We have to get a little bit of ourselves. Shejim is sort of a territorial guardian entity. Okay? And it's a geographical term. We're going to see why in our next video, but it has a lot to do with how God views the earth, specifically after the battle of that. It's also why Pauline vocabulary is geographically rooted from as far as the world geographically worship terms. This is not accidental. Divine governance. Okay, well, what about the council? What do they do now? They're sharing decision-making in the divine council. You go to 1 Kings 22, and they're not just sitting up there admiring God, even though I'm sure they do that. But they have jobs to do. So this is the account of Micaiah, the prophet. I'm going to stop here for a moment. We're going to go a little bit, just a little further. <clears throat> but maybe already your head's wanting to explode because you've heard some things that you did not understand prior to. His explanation as we see. For example... When Saul went to the witch at Endor, and then Samuel talked to him, disembodied. Now, that's a word we don't, you know, we're not comfortable with, uh, at least in my background, but begin to see where all these things begin to fit. Now, here's what you've got. The, you, 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 we got to write this down somewhere. We've got to say it a lot. You may not agree with all of the interpretations that Heiser gives a text. But you can't argue the text. He knows the Hebrew. Anybody here with an English background as far as teaching or a major in English in college or whatever? If you did, I'd probably give you a fit. I'm married to a school teacher. I mean, that... There's a lot of conversations on the way home. You mispronounced this word. And I said, yeah, but people knew what I meant. In Heiser's case, he doesn't mispronounce the word. He takes you to the Greek or to the Hebrew and the most ancient of manuscripts. You, you hear him repeatedly saying in the Old Testament, in the Orthodox community, and, and, and those of you who have been to Israel, you, you, you would have a good understanding of this. For example, at Qumran, and, and by the way, they had this in the news yesterday about some fake uh, manuscripts with the, with the Dead Sea Scrolls at the museum there in Washington. What, what you got to understand, there are over 900 manuscripts and 50,000 fragments. And that somebody could, could fabricate something. You keep hearing, for example, they say this, the, this, the, the, the Shroud of Turin is a fake. Ten years and they come back and say, no, we test again. Now we don't think it's fake. And, and so I, I really believe that this is an attack on the Bible Museum in Washington seeking to undermine people's faith in the Bible. I know this. I've seen that ancient Isaiah text at the book of the scroll. And it was written three, roughly 3,000 years ago because the scrolls were found uh, recently, but they go, go way, way back. And Ron Sinai can go to that scroll and read the Hebrew, and it's 99.9% .9 with my Bible. And so th these things that come along that tend to, you know, to shake, shake us up, say, oh, well, that's not true anymore. I believe it this way. God's word is protected by God. And, and, and so as we look at this, don't let some of the things that you hear a little differently, for example, with with Samuel being disembodied, that speaking, uh, he did, and Samuel gave a prophecy. And so it had to be Samuel. Now, how do I fit that in my, my little brain? I can't. I just know the Bible says it, 
And when the Bible says it, for me, that settles it. Now, it's settled whether I believe it or not, and it's settled whether you believe it or not. God's word is settled. Now, I have to pray and ask God to give me an understanding of it, and that's what we're doing in ABI. And that's why I debated back and forth because we're, we're in the introduction of this Bible study, this, this study he's doing in, in the Divine Council 101. I felt two things could happen tonight to help us. Number one, we have the source of the study. We're using his book on the supernatural that he referred to just a moment ago. But you must understand, Michael Heiser is not a preacher. He is one of the top linguists in biblical studies alive today. And he's a young man. And he's got to be brilliant. Because he, I mean, to, to be able to, to have the command he has of the Hebrew and the Greek and, and then the other text is phenomenal. The thing he is helping me do is connect the dots. So I would hope tonight that you'd understand when you hear people singing about Elohim, they need to make sure it's a capital E Elohim they're singing to because there are other gods out there who go by the same name, go by the same category. And, and so that, that should kind of help us. But, you know, English... English is a difficult language because we have so many words that have dual meanings. And so that's why we have to go to the original language to see what the context would be. And I'm not, and I'm not a linguist. That is as far away from me as the East is from the West. I have to depend on someone or let's do this. How many of you have a, a, a reference Bible or a study Bible? Would you hold your hand up? Okay. What is that? What is that study Bible that you got? What does that mean? You got a study Bible or a reference Bible? How many have just the Bible with no references, just straight text, chapters and verses, without any comments? And, and chances are you got a study Bible because you couldn't, you know, line things up with the Bible that you had that was in straight chapter and verse. Heiser is just, he's just a study Bible. A walking, talking study Bible. When you read in your Bible and you see a footnote that's at the bottom of the page or in the margin referring you to another verse or referring you to some comment, that's what he's doing. Now some people, because he saw something that so few people saw. And he was, he was working on his I think he's writing his thesis whenever he, he, he discovered Psalms 82 and he saw the word God twice in the text, once capitalized, once with a little g, and then that, be, that began him and to, to just do the pursuit and he got into other texts and other texts and other texts and it opened up a whole world. And, and why, is that, why is that necessary? Why is that interesting? That's what we're going to do tonight. That's where we're going to go in just a few moments. I need, but, but right now I just want to kind of broaden our view just a little bit and if you have a question uh, we'll try to answer it and I may not know the answer I may have to go and find it and come back and tell you but what I know is this that there's only one Lord God and he is our father who art in heaven and we have his only begotten son the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and there are three but they're one, and it's the Trinity. And his teachings, when he, he shows the Trinity in the Old Testament, and uh, I, I, I don't mind telling you, that's a big problem for Ron Sinai, is the Trinity. Now, he, he, he believes in the Lord, but he, his whole Judas, Ju, Judaism background, and going back to the Orthodox, I was going to say earlier, that they got their, their schools, and from the time kids can walk, I mean, where we got kindergarten, they got Bible study time, and they study the Word of God. I mean, every day. They don't take a summer break. They're studying every day. And uh, they, these are the Orthodox. You see them with the ringlets, and you see them with the, you know, with the, the uh, hats, and all those have meaning from the whatever part of Europe they came out of. 
uh, in the 1800s, but uh, they're students of the Bible. They're just studying the Old Testament, mostly the first five books. And they do it all their life. And so when it comes to this type of study, Heiser was privy, he had privilege, and so did Ray Vandalon, uh, to, to study with some of these folks. He gets there. Uh, you know, he gets their research on text, and he looks at it, and he sees what he sees in the language, and he compares it to what the Bible backgrounds were then, and, and it just comes to life, and it just, just springs up out of the Scripture. Now, what does all that mean? For me, it means that in these latter days, uh, look, look with me. Let's do this. I'm going I'm to change channels right now, and uh, let's do this. I didn't hear you. The book is being opened again. Oh, yes, it is. But we're going to sit in Scripture. I want to show it to you. Look look with me. i, I got to let this warm up a little bit. It's timid tonight. It knows you're here. And uh, it's going to be slow. As we're going to Daniel, 12th chapter. You can turn ahead. And I want to show you a couple things that I don't believe we can debate or argue over. Uh, I don't know why I turned this loose. It wants to go in a different direction. You just lost it. Oh, you It'll come back. I think it's that audio cable that's pulling me. It's got a weight on it. That's what the problem is. It's got that. It's got that switch, and it's making the. Every time I turn it loose, it wants to do a right hand turn. I had a car do that one time, and really had a horse. I had a horse that would leave you if you wasn't careful. If you didn't hold the reins tight. And you went up a certain road into the bridge, and then there was the, 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 the uh, stable. He would go to that stable because he knew there was some hay in it. And I used to enjoy having fun with my cousins who'd come, and they'd worry me to death about wanting to ride the horse. And I'd say, okay, I just forget to tell them that when we get to the bridge, he's going to turn right. And they'd keep going straight. Of course, they would be off the horse by that point, but I'd help brush them off. And uh, look, look with me. I think this is going to load. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Here we go. Let's go to Daniel. All right. There we go. Daniel 12. Let's go to about verse 4. And let me make this bigger. I think you can see. This is why I want to get back over here. So I think we can see. You can see that, can't you? Okay. Now, look in verse 4. What does it say? But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the what? The end. Now, we know that, well, for example, a criticism of people who, who teach prophecy, the critics of prophecy, want to say, that as they go back to the, the, the Reformation and, and uh, the Dark Ages that we studied historically, which was largely uh, controlled by the, uh, the Catholic Church and everything, you know, had uh, a church-state kind of, kind of world, there was little, if any, teaching on prophecy on a whole scale basis. Though there were individual pastors the problem was, in their day, they didn't have the resources to print books. Whereas the, the, that that was printed back then, the manuscripts that were scribed and written out, uh, but now they have begun to find you know, some of the evidences and letters that go back and, and, and uh, sermons that would have been passed around that did have references to the return of Christ. So it's not, a, it's not an accurate criticism that uh, there was no prophecy taught at any point in time after, after uh, the, the uh, birth of the church. Then in the 1817-1800s, you got C.I. Schofield, you got uh, Darby, you've got others who then began to see in Scripture certain things. And then uh, at a later date, you've got men like Clarence Larkin who did, the, and by the way, he was a Baptist, and, and he did the Larkin dispensation charts, and he saw things a little differently. So it is true that you can, you can go back and see where there was a time where much of this was not understood. But now 
if we're in the end times, what would be a big sign? What could we gauge the end times by if we begin to have a better understanding? And the light's coming on. You see, when he said seal the books, he just put it in the dark. He, if you put something in, in a box, you put a lid on it. Well, it's dark in the box. And then all of a sudden, you begin to see some light. Well, somebody's opening the box. I believe that's the day that we're in. We're getting more and more and more light, and, and not just in, you know, Scripture, but as we look around us and we take Scripture and compare it to world events, we, we've never been where we are. And I believe it all points to the soon coming of Christ. But in verse 4, there are two big tests. And let's see, let's see it. He says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Now, you've got to also remember, this is chapter 12. Daniel 9, 24 is the 70 weeks of Daniel. And in that passage, those few verses, we see basically a, just a capsule of pretty much everything we saw, see on this chart. From, from going back to the birth of the church, which is pictured here, this is a great tribulation. The, 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 the judgments, the seal judgments, the, the uh, bowl judgments, the trumpet judgments, uh, all, all these we were picturing here, 21 of them. And then the return, uh, this is Antichrist coming and setting up his kingdom. They're, they're in the middle of the tribulation. And then we have the Lord's return to the earth to establish his kingdom. And one key point here now, before the tribulation, you got the rapture of the church, and that's where we rise and meet him in the air, and we're with him all the way through the tribulation, come back and we rule with him in the millennium. And then this world as we know it's going to be destroyed, and there's a new heaven, new earth, which Heiser refers to as the resuming of Eden. You see, you go over here to the Garden of Eden, that's where he talks about that God had, he had his headquarters. That's where, that's where he lived. Now, here's what we know, that, that when Adam was invited in, he, 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 he was there, and then when he sinned, he was expelled, but it doesn't say Eden never went away. And so the Garden of Eden is somewhere. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put guards on the entrance to keep man out of it. And so what God started with man way back over here, he's going to end up with it over here. And you've heard me say that over and over and over. Man has got to be restored to the same condition he was in before Adam sinned. Otherwise, Satan wins. Satan's not going to win anything. And so we've got as bright a future as Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. We just need to claim it. I mean, that ought to make our old Baptist souls want to shout and, and, and think about what well, we're so occupied down here. I mean, we're, it, it's kind of like uh, uh, she, she may hear this video, but friend is Jeannie Stowe and she was born blind. Mom had at German measles, and, and Jeannie was born blind, and she said she was four or five years old before she knew she, knew she was blind. And she said the most difficult thing she ever had to do was learn how to walk with her chin up. And the problems were, and she said one day she and her mom were walking, she was a little girl walking down Main Street in Macon, Georgia, and her mama didn't realize it, but she walked Jeannie straight into a light pole. And if you walk with your chin up, guess where the light pole hits? Dead on the nose. And so from then on, she wouldn't walk with her head down. And mom would scold her, don't you walk with her head down. She said, don't you walk into a light pole. And, and so in life, I think that we're too much afraid, maybe, of what we're going to walk into, that we want to walk with our heads down, and God wants us to walk with our heads up. Because we got more up here than we do down here. And, and, and that's life-changing. But now look at this. Now we're going to go sign number one. You're seeing this. And, and uh, this fourth verse, little verse, notice what he says. At the time of the end, many shall run to and what? Fro. You notice 501 7? 
fly over some of our major cities, look out the window of the plane, you see headlights, tail lights, men like ants going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Do you think one day when men go to and fro? Let's go back 100 years ago. Let's go back to 1918. What did they have? T models? What kind of car did you have back then, Joe? Did you have a T model or? But my point is, if you go back, you don't have to go back a thousand years, just to go back a few years. We were limited. There were few paved roads. No interstates. How in the world did they get along? Hey, no cell phones. I mean, you, you, no television. You, you, you go back, go back 200 years ago. If you were to travel, you either had to walk, ride, in a carriage, or, or, or in, in the Middle East, they talk about the camel. I mean, that was their VIP transportation through the desert. But just, just 200 years ago, you were traveling by boat. It was, you know, or just a sailboat, depending on the wind. Then they got the steam, and the Industrial Revolution, you know, came in, brought things in. We got trains, we got cars. Think about this first. The Bible says, you know, people look for these big signs in the sky, you know, these big heavenly signs. Look at, how big is this sign? Look what he said. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end many shall run to, and what? For, and what's this word? Knowledge shall be what? Increased. There's more computing power in this cell phone then the first computers the cities in the U.S. bought to operate the city on. Computers early on were a city block in size. The beast that was talked so much about in the 70s where every man could be numbered was in a house, was housed in a facility, a city block in size. How have things changed? Men going to and fro. Knowledge exploding. I read an article. The article said that the medications we take today will not, will not exist as a primary treatment in the next seven years. That new meds are being developed every day. Every day. And, and so if we stop there for a moment and just think about what we see, you know, the Bible predicting, and, and that, that, that should kind of help us get a focus. But now, I had, you got your handouts? I want to go in that and, and look at that with you. Uh, and we got four of them, and uh, let me uh, let me get my. I don't need to be there. I need to be there. Let's go there. I need to be here. All right. Let's do something that we just talked about, and I think I can make this where you can see it. Try that one. Not big enough. Let's try this one. I think you can read that, can't you? Yep. I right, noticed this. This is out of the the Logos blog. Some of that you can you can see. He gave it pretty quickly. He didn't put them up, but uh, you can do Logos L O G O S dot com, or probably org as well. And that's the software. That, that I primarily use, that along with word search. But uh, this, this article, and it's written by a guest author, but I think, it, and well, you will see in the first statement that he gives here. He says, three ways angels participate in the heavenly council. Now, see, I had, I had no concept on this. In fact, John, you had asked a question last week about what's the value. Pretty much, why do we need to know this? Well, see, I wasn't in the, I, I was in the reality mode that there was you know, this divine counsel, let alone what they did. And, and what, how God incorporates them. And you, you saw the pyramid a bit ago. 
and you notice at the top was, was God, Elohim, and then you got the sons of God in that middle section. Now, in John 1, 12, not John 1, 12, but yeah, John, uh, first chapter, verse 12, but as many as received him unto them, gave he, what's the word? Power or authority to become what? Sons of God. Paul wrote the Corinthians, we've hit it several times, know you not that we'll judge angels. Well, if you remember that pyramid that he put up, angels are at the bottom. Sons of God's in the middle. So we can look at just the title. You just see this in 1 John. It, it's not only twice in the Old Testament, in, in my English Bible, can I find sons of God. And I think there are eight references in the New Testament. And so when Paul talks about the responsibilities that we'll have, ultimately, our life here on earth takes on a whole new meaning for me. It's a preparation time for, what, for what, what's awaiting me and our role. You know, I, I don't know how, why, maybe, I don't think it's the music uh, that we sing, but uh, I, I think that for whatever reason, it, it's kind of been behind the veil. I won't say it's hidden. You know, if you got if you got a veil, sheer curtain, you can kind of see through. You know, something's behind it, but never got a real clear picture of it. But when I begin to look at what He has done for me, and then He says, "I'm going to prepare a place for you." Well, what He's preparing for us is big, because, and I believe I believe Heiser's is right, and he presents a lot of Bible to to, to make his point. He believes, and so do a number of others I have since learned, believe that the role of man was to take the place of the fallen angels, our sons of God. That's why, that's why Adam was in the Garden of Eden. That was our, that was our, I mean, that was a purpose. And if you remember, we've, we've looked at this and looked at this. Uh, this is something that was hidden. Had Satan known, he wouldn't have crucified Jesus. But when they did, that sealed their fate. And that was a lake of fire, period. It was done. He just hadn't been executed yet. He's found guilty. He's been tried. He's been convicted. And he'll be executed. And we know that's going to happen here. I can't put it up because I moved it. But at the end, hey, over here. We, we have the tribulation. At the end, the Lord's coming back. When he does, he's going to bind Satan. He'll be bound a thousand years. And then at the end of the millennium, he's going to be released. And he's going to come back and deceive. And you've got the great white throne of judgment that is going to wait all the unsaved. But Satan's fate is in the lake of fire, which is pictured down here. And, and then for us, we've got the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And, 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 and our glorified state. And he talked about that in, in the graphs that he did. He showed, you know, who these would be. We're glorified. We, we, we had a body like Christ. Now, look at these three ways for a bit. Three ways angels participate. That's a key word, participate. Do angels participate in God's heavenly counsel? Well, if we are higher than the angels, will we participate in God's divine counsel? Now we're talking to you. Do you think that all that God did was to give us a feel-good moment down here on earth? I mean, is this the extent of it? Now I can't say they're happy and joyous moments. But we're here in preparation for what He has prepared for us. Does that make any sense? So we have to understand that God operates on a much broader scheme than I understood. And I can promise you after two plus years of hard study on this, we're talking about a lot of hours, a lot of hours, going through a lot of stuff. I am embarrassed over how little I know. But then I find comfort when I realize how big is God. Paul said when he saw, Paul saw, he was taking third heaven. He saw it. Paul said, I can't tell you. He don't have words. 
There's no way I can describe to you what I saw. And if we could see it tonight in this earthly body, we couldn't handle it. We only understand it when we're in our glorified state. Now, look at this with me. In previous posts, this is, he's, he's referring back to Michael Heiser. Angels, uh, only, he says, find out what the Bible tells us about angels. We know that angels are immaterial members of God's heavenly host. That means they don't have bodies like we do. And we also discuss why Christians should care about angel, angelology in the first place. Now, Heiser points out that the average, I guess, seminary, uh, Bible college, or whatever, might spend two days on angelology. Two days. And as I've shared with you, professor after professor, in the Old Testament, I mean, these were, you know the terminology of crypt course? You ever had any crypt courses? All you had to do was go. Well, that was a lot of the Old Testament. Because all you really didn't know who wrote it, when they write it, and a bit about the, you know, the prophet, if there was one, and some of the, the historical information. But it never did go verse by verse except for a few chapters. The atonement chapter in Isaiah 53. We did. The Psalm, yes, 23 and others, yes. Genesis 1, 2, 3, we pretty well covered those. Mentioned the flood, but just about Noah. Talked about the Tower of Babel, but that's where the languages were confused. But never why. And then the call of Abraham. And then we jump from Abraham, and we studied his life a bit. I mean, great preaching is on the sacrifice of Isaiah. Don't you agree? When God told, God told him to go up on the mountain and sacrifice his son, great preaching. Shadrach, Meshach, in uh, the fire furnace. The fourth man in the fire was Jesus. Hey, Daniel spent a night in the lion's den. We know all that. But what about the connecting verses? Never heard anything about the statue. The dream of Nebuchadnezzar in, in uh, Daniel chapter 2. The head of gold, Babylon, shoulders, media Persia, which is modern Iran. Through the waist is Alexander the Great, which is pictured right here. There's the head of gold, that's Babylon. That, that's Iraq right now. That's media Persia, that's Iran right now. Brass right here was Alexander the Great's empire. He had four generals at his death, two fought each other. Ended up with, with, with one of the Ptolemies uh, in, in the south in Egypt and the Seleucids in the north. And they, they fought then, they're fighting now. And then the legs of iron and clay, or the legs of iron and feet of iron and clay, that's Rome. Eastern Division, Western Division. Rome and then Constantinople. And then the revived Roman Empire is to come back. There are ten toes, five on each feet. And, and, and that's, that's, that's alluded to throughout Scripture. So I, I had a bird's eye view, but I had no idea what was going on behind the scenes. And so what I've attempted to do is to take, uh, to, to bring it to you in a way, well, first off, it's got to be pretty simple for me to understand it. So I've studied it a lot. And many of you have helped me. Karen sent me great stuff. In fact, that pyramid I put up, you gave that to me two years, a year ago or longer and just hadn't had a place to incorporate it. And then I see it in a video. So I said, I had a lot of uh, I can see where all this is going to be. But let's talk about this for a little bit. He goes on to talk about the first post he did. and, and, and but I, want to, I want to share this. I'm not going to read all of it. But look, in the first post we saw heavenly beings make up a council over which Yahweh presides. But what does a council do? Do they float through heaven all day playing harps? Do they simply worship Yahweh? Or do they observe or even participate in decision making? You see that, that statement right here? You got it on your notes? Underline it. Underline it. Right here. So if you ask me, why is it worth my time to study about these angels? I'm interested in that decision-making process. Aren't you? You got to think about that. Aren't you? Now, let's go a bit further then. According to Heiser, the service of angels can be expressed in three broad categories. Participation in God's heavenly counsel, obedience to God's decisions, and praise of the Most High. And uh, he, he's picked point to this in page 32. 
while the second and third categories are probably quite familiar to us, the first one requires some exploration. In this post, we will examine how heavenly beings participate in Yahweh's counsel. Are you interested? Well, then now you're going to see all this in all the materials that has rights, but especially in the supernatural, you, you, you're going to see some of this. Let, let, let me move this up where you can uh, see it above me. And uh, let's see. What about angels make decisions? See 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23? We talked about it. This is a meeting over Ahab. The consensus in this divine council was he had to go. He had to die. It was discussed. I sure hope my name didn't brought up. But Ahab was. Was brought up. Now, I'll be honest with you. I knew in Scripture that Satan's name is adversary. I know he's an enemy. I knew that. I didn't realize that God included others in a council. I thought about the Trinity. If you'd asked me, I'd say, well, God, God, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But then as we see Psalms 82, where you got some of those that were in the council who went bad. And God judged them. And he said, you're going to die like men. That's all I'll tell you too. And so we'll begin to, to see some things. I, I've said it, and I'll say it again and again and again. My prayer life changed radically. I don't fill my prayers with a lot of, a lot of verbiage. A lot of talk. I just get to the point. I just get to the point. Straight to the point. I know they're enemies. What we're going to see in the next, the, the next week, especially, with, we won't finish the whole, all four outlines tonight, handouts. In fact, there's one on Enoch. I believe I gave you the God's one. It's seven pages, I think. Out of the book of Enoch. And uh, you, you should see some things there. It might cause the hair to rise a little bit on the back of your neck. But we, we won't do that tonight because that, that may be next week we can do some of that. And some of these, these meet up with each other. Look, look, in 1 Kings 22, the prophet Micaiah reports a vision that is a is strange but informative when to end the workings of Yahweh's counsel. And, and, and so you, you, you need to reread these when you get home, look at it, think about it. But let's, let's, let's look in that second paragraph right here. And, and Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left hand. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Remoth Gilead? And one, said, and one said one thing and another said another. They had to be Baptist. I mean, it just had to be. But think about this for a moment. Would you have ever thought that God would have taken up time to deal with a tyrant like Ahab and discuss what are we going to do about it? And look, look, look who's responding now. Look at this. Now, we don't know how big this council is. I mean, some think it was 70 because they see that in several other passages. I think Heiser does. It, it was at least maybe 70. Some said 72. But look at this for a moment. Let's, let's follow the dialogue again. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. I said that too. And that's got to be in heaven. But here's the prophet. The prophet's down here. Ahab's down here. And he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the, what's his word? Host of heaven. Every time you see the word host of heaven, and, and oh my, it is a lot. I, I think about the stars. Because that's what God told Abraham, look up and count them. He said, if you can count those, that's how many descendants you're going to have. 
And I believe there's a guardian angel for every man ever lived. So how many angels were up there? And I don't know all else who make up this heavenly host. That we can look at that pyramid and go back and we see that sons of God. Some want to say maybe it's limited there and then you got the other angels. But, but I, I know that God's got it all worked out. I don't have to be worried about it. But it sure makes me think for a bit. And, and, and he goes on to say, And all hosts have been standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. So we know that they're on, on both sides. And, and he goes on to say, Uh, you know, who, who will entice Ahab, and, and then, and, and one said one thing, another, and then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I never knew that. But you got to know that this spirit's on the right side. So if I wonder why I changed it. He didn't say an angel come and stood. Then said, sons of God came and stood. He said, a spirit. Then a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord, said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his what? Prophets. I wonder if that's going on in Washington. Touch oh, across the board. We who live in glass houses can't throw stones, Charles. Because the pot calls the kettle black. What we've had going on in Washington does not know a label. And it's hard for me to say it, but it's true. But we do have a man that's praying. And I, I appreciate it. But he's got a lot of opposition in both aisles. Both aisles. Now, follow me for a moment. Look at this now. He says, look at this, a lying spirit to all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you, sh and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these Your prophets, the Lord has declared disaster for you. That's all they had. In this passage, we see the heavenly hosts are standing beside Yahweh. Heiser notes that the, the, the posture uh, speaks of being available and, uh, you know, being available, ready, and willing to carry out the superior's command. And so that then goes back into to they, they make decisions. And we also know that they obey. And then in, in the passage, as you see, the next we got, however, we also see a greater level of involvement. Yahweh has decided that Ahab will be enticed to die in battle at Ramoth Gilead. But notice how, invo how he involves the council. He asks them who and how questions. It is not Yahweh, he, it is not that Yahweh can't figure figure this one out. Rather, he invites his creatures into, de into devising a solution. According to Heiser, this passage presents us with a clear instance where God has sovereignly decided to act but allows uh, his lesser intelligent servants to participate in how his decision is carried out. Who would have thought it? Can I explain that? No, can't. If I could, I'd be too smart. And God would just have to humble me some more. I believe there's some things that we just absolutely must leave up to God. Amen. But we also must have respect for that that God's put in order. And I'm afraid that in Jude, we talked about they had no respect for dignities. We're living in a day where we have little respect for authority, and especially God's authority. Yes, Walter. Yep. Well, but, but the part he... See, I like the Deuteronomy 29 text. He says that that uh, 
to reveal things belonging to us and to our children and our children's children, but the, but the, the, the secret things belonging to God. He lets us know enough. And here the fact is that we have to understand that God has things in place that I never imagined. But he's in control. There aren't free agents to do what they want to do. Yes, Walter. If God did, I imagine, let's do it this way. Uh, there's no temptation taking you. That's but it's common to man. In other words, every temptation. God never tempts anybody. James first chapter teaches this. God never tempts anybody to do evil. Satan does that. David had every opportunity to do the right thing. And as a result, if it had been something with God's permission or whatever, then the consequence would not have been nearly as tough on, da uh, on David as it were. The child of Beersheba more died. Absalom, his son, sought to kill him. I mean, David scrambled. I mean, he, 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 I mean the, the sword never left his house. And it was because of his indiscretion, his sin, it, what he did. So uh, we get forgiveness, and that's what he got in, in Psalms 51. He got forgiveness, but he paid the consequence of his sin all, all the way through his life. But he had every opportunity. I, I'm satisfied that God, I've seen it illustrated this way, and, and uh, I believe when you and I face temptation, you got one sitting on one shoulder and one sitting on the other. You got God speaking to us, and he'll bring the scriptures to our mind that, that's in our heart. That's why it's important to hide the word of God in your heart. On the other side, you got that voice that maybe told David, hey, you're the king. You can have anything you want. You're king. And, and it's kind of like the former president said, he did what he did because he could. And that's why he did it. David did what he did because he could. And so, yeah, we've run out of time. I've had fun. And, uh, but you see next, angels bear witness. That's what we're going to pick this up next week. We'll complete this, this part of it. But and then you can go through the notes. If you have questions, then next week, if you'll, if you'll bring those. And, and Harvey, can we have a meal next week of some kind? Okay. Because I have missed it. <laughs> it's like you don't miss it. I should have. But I was, I was eyeball deep at lunch today. And then I cut myself shaving tonight up under my nose. I put a new blade in. And I was, I thought I was doing good. And they didn't even feel it, these new razors. And then I looked and the blood was just, it took me forever. I was late getting here to stop it. Don't you know you're supposed to be using a electric razor now? Oh, what kind? Electric razor. I got them. Use them. I used to. But then I heard on TV to cause cancer. Oh, no. <laughs> so, no. I, I got, I've been on the blade, but this first time I really cut You're myself. too old for a blade now. I, I promise my hands are shaking probably. Yeah. Well, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Bible study. We don't understand... Lord, to tell you, I know everything you put for us tonight, I don't. I just know this. I know you're God. I know you're the creator of our universe. I know that there's nothing, nothing that you didn't create. Moon, stars, planets, everything that's out there is your creation. And it operates on your timetable and your purpose. We know that you created and breathed into Adam the breath of life. And we have been, because we're the seed of Adam, we have received the blessings all these years. And we know you gave your son to die for us. That if we believe on him, receive him, the Lord Jesus, in our heart, believing and trusting him to forgive us and to save us, we have salvation. And Lord, we believe you're coming again. And we don't know exactly when, but we're looking tonight. And we pray, Lord, you'd help us to be prepared to prepare others. And we just pray that you, these studies, that we would know enough that we can go back and reread what we did tonight in First Kings and see that this conversation that you held 
with a with, with the host of heaven about Ahab. And we're going to see others where we see the council having met. Lord, bless us, not just to, to believe your word, but Lord, may we live your word. And if Micaiah could have a vision of your throne, Lord, give us a glimpse. Bless us, man. Be with us. Be with the sick. Be with our family members that suffer. And we pray for my family. And I pray for Mary Catherine and, and her kids as she nears heaven's portals today. And Father, we just pray you'd bless them. Comfort Ellen, Dub, be with them in Christ's name. Amen.